Hey, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I tend to travel a lot. Um, I just was in Hawaii, which is, don't feel sorry for me, but uh, speaking to the University of Hawaii, and uh, my role there was to um, talk to the students and coaches and uh, healthcare about eating disorders, but um, a lot of it has to do with the athletic programs. And um, so it was interesting because there's kind of a version to kind of everybody has so much things to do that um, they were wondering, well, what is this person coming to talk to us about um, eating disorders? And uh, I talked to the coaches first and uh, they, after hearing what I had to say about performance and nutrition, they had all the students attend the conference, so they were standing room only. And then six individuals who came to the conference, even though it wasn't known to the health center, um, were transparent in saying that they were struggling with eating disorders. So it's a kind of a world, especially that, uh, and there's no, if anyone here is a dietitian who wants to live in beautiful Hawaii, they have no uh, eating disorder nutritionist there. We have to do it from the coast. We have to do the uh, virtual programs with them. So all the people that need help, and yet there's not a nutritionist that basically is um, an eating disorder. So t yesterday I was in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and I drove last night to get here, speaking to you today, and tomorrow morning I'll leave for Israel. <laughs> So a lot of travel. And people always wonder, well, does your wife go with you? Well, she chooses not to. And um, I travel all the time and she doesn't travel with me. And people are surprised I uh, will be married 44 years. And uh, I heard my wife talking to a neighbor and overheard her and she described me as a model husband, which I thought was good, until I looked it up. A model is a small replica of the real thing. So that wasn't so good, was it? <laughs> um, but uh, so today, uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, the brain. And um, it's interesting because the three areas that I really concentrate in working for Eating Recovery Center, and we have different tracks, um, certainly the eating disorder world, which is an anorexia, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, RFIDs, uh, OFSFEDs, a whole bunch of other areas that deal with uh, disordered eating. But I also do a whole lot of work in the area, which we have a um, track for mood and anxiety. And uh, then that deals with trauma. And we also uh, deal, of course, with uh, um, overeating in the sense of the eating disorder, the binge eating, and also deal with addictions. So if you're in that world and you say, are those diseases, we call them disorders, um, they're diseases of what? They're diseases of the brain. And I found out that when working with especially eating disorder patients, and this came to me from a colleague that is in uh, Fort Collins, maybe you've heard of her, um, uh, Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin has autistic um, uh, spectrum disorder, high end, has a PhD. And what she learned from working with children and even um, uh, adolescents who have autism spectrum disorder is that they tend to think in pictures. So that there's similarities in the brain, they're not the same conditions and lots of differences, but there's certain things that parallel in autism that parallel with these eating disorders, particularly anorexia. And the anorectic also thinks in pictures. If you can think of any way to kind of get information to them through pictures, it kind of accelerates their connection and their uh, recovery. And so that what we're going to use for pictures to kind of describe what they're going through and um, uh, the neurochemistry and neurobiology is really a nice inroad. So much of the information I'm going to share with you today um, will almost seem like, well, I knew all that nutrition, but it's application. It's bringing neuroscience into the therapy session. Uh, and so uh, I wrote this book about five years ago called The Brain Fix, and this book is only um, really 250 pages of prose. Um, and the original book I turned in to the publisher was 900 pages and had 1,000 references. Well, the general public could care less. <laughs> and uh, so they were going to make it just 350 pages of um, content. And I said, no, I need to have, in case someone wants to know where this information comes from, um, <clears throat> the different references. So <clears throat> if you are interested in any of the information that I'm sharing with you today that might be different and counter to what um, you have understood, that um, this is a great book as a, as a reference for that. Um, so the first thing uh, I want to share with you is that when I ask patients, I go into groups of patients and I'll say, what is this condition? We'll say, we'll just talk initially, anorexia, what is it a disease of? And they will say, it's a disease of the brain. 
And I said, what do you think your brain looks like? If I handed out a piece of paper and you were going to draw your brain, how would you draw your brain? And think of that for a second. But I'm kind of summarizing this with these two pictures in terms of their perception of their brain when they're struggling with this disorder called eating disorder. And one is, is that they picture that there's holes in the brain. It's almost like Swiss cheese. There's just lack of cells in that area. And another one, especially when we talk to addicts, they think it's like um, you know, a fried egg. Their brain's all scrambled. Okay? So those are the pictures. And yet this first picture is actually an excellent representation of the type of people that I work with um, in the different categories. So we're going to look at just simple CT scans. And you'll see amazing um, similarity between these conditions that we treat. So here, um, we're going to look at the brain of a person who has anorexia nervosa and a normal brain. And what I hope you see is, this is the normal brain. It's fairly dense and there's not a whole lot of dark areas um, where the sulci and gyri are in the brain. And the ventricles, comparatively, are small. And so you look at the brain of the anorectic and you see these large dark areas, these separations between the sulci and gyri, and you see that these ventricles are much larger um, in the anorectic brain. What that represents is loss of cells. So that the anorectic, at the state that they come in, especially into residency programs, uh, critical or acute care, that they're missing cells. So it's, in a sense, holes in the brain. Well, look at that brain <clears throat> for the person who's struggling with an eating disorder. And now we're going to look at a brain of an alcoholic. And if you look at their brain, you'd say, well, I see the, the same normalcy where there's very little dark areas and the sulci are tight. And then we look at the brain of the person who's been struggling with alcohol. We see, again, the wider ventricles and we see the separation between the, the gyri are larger. So if I show a person this brain versus that brain, they kind of look the same. It's different totally in terms of its manifestations, but they're missing cells. Now we're going to look at the uh, brain of a person who's struggling with trauma or PTSD. Again, uh, the normal brain is fairly dense, not a whole lot of separation, but in the PTSD, the sulci get larger and the ventricles uh, get larger. And then we look at an interesting comparison, and that is with a person with Alzheimer's disease. So here is the brain that is the healthy brain, and then we see again the larger ventricles and sulci. So no, there's no similarity necessarily in behavior with the Alzheimer's and the erectrics, but it's kind of similar. Now there's something that we're going to go through today, and so what do you do about this? In the anorexic, in the addict, addict, in the person with trauma, the brain is forgiving. We can resurrect this brain back to its normalcy. And what you'll find out today, we cannot do that with the Alzheimer's. And that very difference helps to explain in terms of the different interventions we would perform in terms of therapy and nutrition. So, we're going to look at some of the nuances that have been created and that are very helpful in terms of the research that proves that what we're doing works. So when I talk about, okay, you're missing these cells and there's something that we can do to replace those cells. But how would we know? We can't really see it real clearly on necessarily a, a, these more basic scans like CT scan. But we have a technique in neuroscience and that technique is called voxel-based morphology. So actually, we can go into any part of the brain and count the cells. So I can count the cells anywhere and do certain interventions and see that those interventions work because those cells are replaced. So that's a kind of a new, um, not necessarily new, but recent um, kind of use of brain imaging. Then, in terms of the connectivity of the circuits of the brain, how they connect with other areas, whether we strengthen those connections, we have a um, particular imaging technique that's called diffusion tensor uh, imaging. We can actually see if these connections are strong between certain parts of the brain and communicating in the brain. So the amazing thing, this is kind of like we are making so many significant changes in the care of individuals. So at, this, at the level of um, residency, we're looking at that the people come in for things that like anorexia or depression, a lot of times it's not that they're not getting good treatment outpatient or even IOPs, but at a higher level of care, we're dealing with what are sometimes labeled um, treatment resistant. So we have people who have treatment resistant depression, people with treatment resistant um, 
um, anorexia, people with treatment resistant um, conditions. And the nuances that have occurred in terms of the repairing of the brain are amazing. So we're going to look at this person here who is sort of the poster boy for improvements that we have come um, since the 80s. In 1984, Terry Wallace was in a car wreck. It's a significant car wreck where he severed the nerves of his spine and Terry was in a coma for 19 years. And when he came out of the coma, he could neither talk nor move. Now I'm not saying he's moving and playing sports or that he's talking a mile a minute, <clears throat> but Terry Wallace can once again speak and move, which is pretty um, amazing um, in terms of today's science. Then we're going to look at certain techniques that people who are, and I'm going to use the example of treatment resistant depression, that they are on numerous medications, numerous therapies, but they don't seem to progress and stay with their depression. And so these new techniques are going in and they're kind of resuscitating that brain. So some of the techniques are um, invasive and kind of in the research stage, but this is called deep brain stimulation. We can actually go in there and stimulate the brain and all of a sudden it starts working. It's almost like um, resuscitating the heart. There's other techniques we call ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. They've been around for a while, but now we're using them as kind of an adjunct to help people to basically get through their depression, sometimes even Parkinson's and um, eating disorders. Um, and then we have certain medications that are kind of being researched. And this is um, our medication that was presented at the Alzheimer's conference where it halted the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So there's so many things that we're going to be in the frontier of seeing changes with and yet these changes won't happen if we just do these techniques. So if you think about um, when we talk about um, this treatment resistant depression, uh, kind of think of it like a snow globe <laughs> and it's just kind of sitting there and nothing's happening and you shake it and you got all this movement and but then after a while that kind of snow in the snow globe settles and you're back to the original snow globe to make that permanent you have to combine these particular techniques and medication together with therapy and what we're talking about today nutrition if it's just one dimensional then we kind of hear the negatives about these interventions they're not long lasting and so the research is going on that we're basically combining um, this as a as a integrated approach um, so I want to kind of spend a little bit of time with you in terms of what we know now for these brains, these alcoholics, these addiction, these eating disorders, and trauma, and what we know in terms of how the brain will um, regenerate itself. So um, as quickly as I can, and hopefully it will be clear to you, we're going to talk about neuroregeneration. So where those holes are, how do we replace those cells? When I was early on in um, medical school at Duke, um, we were told that once you lose a cell in the brain, that's it, it doesn't come back. So I lived for many, many parts of my career with thinking there's nothing we can do to replace these cells. However, due to um, research that was done on um, uh, antidepressants, particularly SSRIs, we found out that if they totally worked as serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you would get results in about 24 to 40 hours. And most people know it's going to take probably about four to six weeks. So there's a different mechanism that may be involved and part of that has to do with neuroregeneration. So this is a picture, obviously, of a coronal section of the brain. We're kind of looking into the brain. And you will see that it's going to isolate a particular area of the brain down here. And it's both a left and right, this area here. And this is called the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus, you may, if you know anything about neuroscience, you may know that that's the area of short-term memory. That's where we make new memories, is in this particular area. And if we kind of take a higher magnification, you can see where it kind of curls around like this. It looks like a horn. And now we're going to magnify it to a great degree. And inside this hippocampus are cells that you might call stem cells or undifferentiated cells. We call them in neuroscience, they're amplified progenitor cells. They're almost non-existent. You can see them in this drawing, but really they're, they're very, very small. Like electron microscopy barely picks them up. But what this means is all the cells that we'll ever need to keep our brain replacing cells is available in the hippocampus.
They're all there. And they're kind of dormant, and they basically don't have any function. They have to be stimulated to basically be certain functional um, neural cells or glial cells or astrocytes uh, for the rest of the brain. So we basically stimulate these cells. A lot of times, that's what talk therapy does, whether it's CBT, DBT, ACT, or cup of tea. What you're really doing is you're basically stimulating these cells, and what is going to happen, they're going to proliferate. They're going to grow and become into functioning cells. And when they mature to that functional state, they will take and leave the hippocampus and go to those areas where we saw cells were missing, and they will migrate to them and replace them. So that is pretty much what happens in all of those cases where I showed you where they're missing cells. They can be replaced because they're stimulated for the hippocampus, proliferate, and then migrate to areas where the cells are missing. Um, so who can kind of put the pieces together and answer that question, why can the alcoholic or the addict or the anorectic or the trauma person basically replace the cells, but the Alzheimer's patient can't? Any ideas? Okay, this is the hippocampus. It deals with memory. What can't people who have Alzheimer's do? They don't have short-term memory. So when you get to the point where you lose your short-term memory, you have fewer or almost very few cells left. So there's no cells to generate to replace those cells. Whereas that young anorectic and so forth, their brain is very forgiving. We can basically regenerate that brain. So this is called neural regeneration. And that's a process that basically takes place. And it is more than just kind of shaking up the snow globe. It's basically also stimulating those cells to replace the cells that are missing. The second area that we see happening in, in, in um, uh, neuroscience with repair of the brain is called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is actually um, recreating the circuitry, recreating the connections in the brain, or changing the connections so it's most appropriate to certain behaviors. And there's several steps to this. Um, so the first step is you have a neuron, and it's going to kind of uh, reconnect to another neuron, and that this here is called the axon, and it's going to maybe switch to another nerve, and that's called axonal guidance. Like a tugboat's going to leave this um, axon to another nerve. And then after it kind of uh, docks with another nerve, you're going to see up here that you have certain connections from this axon that kind of connect to the um, uh, neuron that it's going to communicate with. And this is called dendritic arborization. So that means those extensions are like roots in a plant, and they're going to grow. And you can see that here, when we look at the dendrite, it begins to bud, and then it will kind of extend out and it will connect with another nerve. So that's called dendritic arborization. Now, once the connection is made up here, then you're going to have the connection between the dendrite and the cell, and this is called synaptogenesis. And if we look even closer at that, you're going to see this cell is communicating with this cell, so it's going to develop more receptors receptors, and it's going to develop more neurotransmitters, which is a communication system. And in this process, um, we will basically call it um, uh, quantum zero, and that means that it makes the connection stronger. So that's a process that happens in terms of neuroregeneration along with um, neuroplasticity. And then finally, all of this happens a lot better if there are growth factors. And a growth factor that's very prevalent that we measure to see if what we're doing is working and uh, what types of things make this happen, it's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And when you kind of read studies that it talks about brain changes, a lot of times we look for the increase in that brain-derived neurotrophic factor or it's kind of miracle growth for the brain. So three things that we know that basically increase this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. One of them is therapy. The particular therapy that's been studied the most is cognitive behavioral therapy. Another thing that we found helps to increase that connectedness is meditation, and then it's gone on to be mindfulness and things like DBT increase this. And then finally, the right type of activity. Um, healthy, um, not negative, um, Exercise can help increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So those are the two techniques. Now this neuroplasticity um, is fascinating. I don't have a, a video here for you, but you can look it up um, sometime. And you just will log into Google and you'll um, uh, put uh, into it um, the, um, the following information. And 
I'll think of it in a second what the website is, but nonetheless, it's the phantom hand. So what you're gonna see in this video is that if a person puts two hands on a table, they're gonna put two hands on the table, and they're gonna be asked to remove one of their hands. And in place of that hand, they're going to place a rubber hand, and they're gonna put a sheet over it. So it looks like there's two hands on the table. And the therapist is going to ask them and point to their rubber hand, and they're gonna say, is that your hand? And of course, the person's gonna say, no, that's not my hand, that is a rubber hand. So the next thing the therapist might do is put a mirror and say, now look in the mirror, you see the hand, and I'm telling you it's your hand, now you can see it, and I told you it is, is it your hand? Of course, the individual's gonna say, no, that's not my hand, it's a rubber hand. And then the therapist will take from underneath the table, they're going to, um, no, before they do that, I'm sorry, they're gonna take two brushes, and they're going to brush both hands, the real hand and the rubber hand, simultaneously. And the um, person who's being tested will make an astounding uh, face, because they can feel the brush on the rubber hand as if it's their hand. And then the therapist will take, from underneath the table, they'll take a hammer and they'll pound the rubber hand and the person will jump out of their seat. So you wonder what's happening there. Well, that's called neuroplasticity. We've actually just wired that rubber hand to the person so it actually behaves like it's their hand. That sounds astounding, but that's a lot of times with people who have prosthesis. Their kind of mechanical hand becomes a part of them. And so when we do neuroplasticity, we're actually doing this. We're actually reconnecting brain so the brain starts to believe certain things. Um, so here is the point where we get to the nutrition. If a person is going to resurrect their brain, if they're an addict or if they are anorectic or if they have trauma, that the stimulus is going to come from basically the different therapies and the directed therapies. But think of those therapies that are stimulating the growth like seeds. If I take those seeds and I place them on this floor and I come back in two weeks, you more than anyone else know that those seeds won't grow. And you'll say the reason they won't grow is because they require sunlight, soil, um, and water. Well, it's the same thing that's critical for the brain healing. So many programs do great therapy, but they really don't understand the science behind the needs for nutrition and how that is, is paramount in terms of the brain healing. If you just have people eat um, and whatever and get calories, then it's not going to basically create these changes as efficiently if we don't combine the therapy together with the uh, nutrition. So the question becomes, of all the things that we eat, what is the most important nutrient for brain healing? Does anybody want to guess? Say it loud so I can hear you. <laughs> Old man, I'm deaf. Yes, please. Uh, omega-3 is okay. And that is an excellent, excellent answer, okay? And that's actually number two, okay? Um, so that is definitely very important, but this one is kind of, won't, that won't be of any value to you if you don't have this first one. Any guesses? Someone said I heard them whisper. Glucose, okay. And what's another word for glucose? Sugar, <laughs> right? Okay, so it turns out that the most important thing is sugar. If you tell this to a, a client or a patient, they're going to say, oh, you mean this? <laughs> well, yes, but really all sugar in the form it takes in your body and when it enters the brain is going to be in the form of glucose and all carbohydrates turn to glucose. Now, the reason we say this is that glucose is so important, it is the energy. The body will not heal without energy and that the rest of the body can use all sorts of sources of energy, particularly fat, and any calorie will help the body heal, but in the brain, the brain is a pure glycolyzer. It only uses carbohydrates efficiently. Anything less is going to cause problems. So, so many times, especially in the malnutrition of the anorectic, in the person who's depressed who doesn't eat, and certainly in the addict, um, what would be the worst diet or food plan for them to go on? low carb, keto, paleo, wheat belly, all of those would be very detrimental for their recovery because they need glucose for the brain to heal. It's a pure glycolyzer. Um, so 
this is the thing that when you're talking to patients to kind of make them connect with this reality that their brain needs carbohydrates that turn into glucose that travel to the brain provide energy for their brain to heal and function and so the symptoms that I'll say what if you didn't have lunch and now it's three or four o'clock in the afternoon what will be your symptoms and they will say their symptoms are difficulty concentrating irritability fatigue shakes and jitters and also memory problems those are all in the brain function. So when you don't get that amount of carbohydrates to the brain, you can't function as well because carbohydrates are so important for the brain to function. And it's a complicated issue because if it's too high, if the blood sugar passing by the brain is too high or it's too low, both cause consequences. So we've got to fit into a particular zone when we talk about this. And another kind of take home message is kind of interesting to them and that is that there was a while back where the Kellogg's people were um, criticized because that cornflakes um, was basically less valuable than the box that cornflakes comes in and so they sent their research and developers out to find something valuable about cornflakes so that in the future mothers will feed their children breakfast and they'll be able to charge more for cereal so they sent them out and they came back and they were very discouraged. Oh, really all that's contained in this cereal is glucose. And yet that became a critical point because in terms of memory, in terms of a young child that's in school and they're learning, that at the point they're hearing information, whether or not that information will be stored long term depends on the amount of glucose that's passing through the brain at that particular time. So you cannot put things into memory as well if you don't have enough carbohydrates basically going to the brain. And then when they have that test a week later and they have to retrieve that memory into the moment in order to answer questions, they cannot retrieve that information if they don't have enough glucose circulating their brain. So it became somewhat of the foundation of what we say today that Breakfast is one of the most important meals of the day, but particularly making sure you get enough, not too much, not too little, of glucose. Um, so, when does, and this is the third component, so you've got the brain that's going to have neural regeneration and neuroplasticity. It takes um, therapy to stimulate that to happen, and then you have the nutrition, so you have the energy, so this growth and change can happen. But even if you do those things, you still will not help the brain heal efficiently if you don't have what? What's the, when does the brain do this healing? Sleep, exactly, but not any sleep. It's not just going to the bed, closing your eyes. It only really happens, as we'll see, during stage three and four sleep. That's called restorative sleep. That's the only time. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because that's the time that you put out what orchestrates the healing, which is called human growth hormone. It's only put out during stage three and four, so it's critical in terms of our sleep patterns that we have enough three and four sleep. So in that sense, and this is kind of what is set up for patients whose brain is healing that it's going to happen during stage three and four sleep down here when you put out the growth hormone and if you understand sleep we go through a cycle so the cycles we go through is we start off in stage one then go stage two stage three and four then we move back up to what's called rem sleep rapid eye movement sleep and then we go into stage one two three and four and that we have these segments that last about an hour to an hour and a half and we need to get about five to six of these total um, segments per evening because we tend to that growth hormone that we put out tends to be most active during the fourth fifth and six hours that basically you've been asleep so when you hear, yes, you need sleep to heal, that you need at least eight hours because that's when most of the growth hormone starts to be active. And if you just get this sleep, you still put it out, but it's not as active if you're not getting that total eight hours. So really, the healing of our brain, the majority of it happens at this particular time of the evening. So if this is when we have healing of the brain, then what do we need available to us when that brain heals? is glucose. <laughs>
So that becomes a critical um, kind of intervention here in these patients. So we're going to look at a typical scenario, which I've simplified for the, on the behalf of the patients. But what we want to have is an ability to guarantee we have energy during 4, 5, and 6 o'clock for brain healing to occur um, if we get up at 7. So typically a person might have dinner at 6, and they have a meal, and it has some carbohydrate, and basically provides glucose through our blood sugar and it will last about three to four hours so what we had in our meal is no longer there by 10 o'clock but the fortunate thing is just like we store energy as fat we can store glucose as energy in a form called glycogen and we store it in our liver and we store it in our muscles what is in our muscles can't leave the muscles to go to the brain so we're pretty much dependent as kind of drawing from our liver glycogen which we have about three to five hours worth and so come along 3 a.m. we're what? we're deficient and really efficient amount of glucose so now we're at 3 a.m. we got to get to 7 and so the brain and all our brains will convert to ketones and this is a kind of a difficult concept, but it's important, especially these people who think that ketosis is so wonderful. Um, and I could give a whole talk in terms of the mechanism of action that makes it so confusing because everybody's promoting it and it does do good things if you have children who have seizures or you're treating glioblastoma multiformity. So you get confused and say, well, it's good for the brain. And then you'll hear some studies that ketones actually help protect the cells that are already there. The problem is, is when we're dealing with brain healing, we have this nuance, new cells that are just kind of maturing. And when cells are maturing through that process, it turns out that ketones are toxic. So if we take a newly developed cell, then that ketones will basically be toxic to those cells that are basically being regenerated. Um, a good example of this would be that when you study the chemistry of ketones, they basically are somewhat derivatives of alcohol. So if you have a patient, I know a lot of you know this, but a lot of people don't, that if you're a diabetic and you go into ketosis and you're seen on the road swerving, the, the policeman stops you, that what will you show up on the breathalyzer test that you have basically been drinking? Ketones show up as alcohol, so it's an alcohol derivative. Well, we know that women who are um, binge drinkers, uh, while they're pregnant, they are vulnerable to fetal alcohol syndrome. So the alcohol itself will destroy the DHA that makes up the brain. So this is very critical for these new forming cells not to basically have to depend on ketones because basically it will cause cell death as opposed to what we're trying to do is to replace cells. So we've got to figure out what to do about this. And we're trying to kind of convince the patient that it's necessary to have sleep but also to eat correctly so your brain will heal. So um, that it's kind of like what we train the patients to do and to visualize is similar to which was an old technique not used anymore if you run marathons you know this of what we call carbohydrate loading so the way that carbohydrate loading acted um, way back is that you have a certain amount of glycogen storage and so if you're going to do the marathon on the seventh day that about a week before you're going to go on a zero or low carbohydrate diet and you're going to deplete as much as you can of your glycogen for the next three days um, and you're also going to exercise to deplete that so come around three days four days before the race now you've depleted your glycogen so that um, people who run marathons they need to have more glycogen storage in their muscles because it's called hitting the wall I run 26 miles but when I get to the 20th mile I hit the wall I can't move because I'm out of glycogen so we're gonna load glycogen so we do it this way so after we've depleted it then it gives the liver uh, and the muscles a signal to produce more of the enzyme that's going to store carbohydrate should you consume it so now those levels of enzymes are very very high and so for the next three days we're going to load we're going to eat everything that's carbohydrate you know, pasta and potatoes and breads and so forth and that because we've basically replenished our stores but we've made more enzymes now we're going to overload we're going to have a lot more glycogen so we can make it through that 26 mile race um, we don't do that anymore primarily because glycogen is stored with three parts of water <coughs> stored with three parts of water 
so that if I'm going to run a race, that means I've almost gained 10 pounds of weight, which is going to slow me down. So it doesn't really work in terms of helping the efficiency of running. But it is keeping the muscles basically um, saturated with glycogen to make the race. So the new technique is not so um, amazing, but we're trying to saturate these muscles with as much glycogen as we can, or we're trying to keep them saturated and we don't basically use that glycogen until we absolutely have to. So the new technique, or what's used now, is a person's going to have a sports drink, maybe a half an hour to an hour before the race, and totally saturate their muscles. And then every 15 to 20 minutes, they're going to redose that with, um, at the aid station with about a cup of that sports drink. And the sports drink is nothing more. I mean, it's amazing that they've made this into a, a sellable product. It's a 10% glucose solution that contains some electrolytes. But that 10% is important because it's going to restore what we've lost in that 15 minutes of running. So we keep the glycogen stored. We don't borrow it until we absolutely need it. And we make a race. And we can help people who even run 100 mile races by basically using this technique. Well, this is a technique I'm trying to convince the patients in terms of their eating plan and what it will do. So in their case, we're trying to saturate the liver. We're trying to keep it saturated. We don't want to borrow from the liver during the day because we want it available during those last hours of sleep when the brain is doing their healing. So the key thing is, is our goal is to not borrow from the glycogen stores during the entire day. So I know this looks like a confusing drawing, but I'll try to kind of explain this complexity of eating and blood sugar and the brain in this little diagram for the patient. So what we have here is we've taken the person's brain out and in the center of the brain, you'll see an H, it stands for hypothalamus, and that is the area of the brain that works as a glucostat. It's going to record the amount of sugar that's passing by. And that here we eat, and it doesn't go from here to there. It goes down our esophagus, as you all know. The only thing the stomach does is break big pieces to little pieces. It goes to this pyloric valve, and once it gets to the duodenum, it's absorbed into the bloodstream, it goes up to the brain, and the brain recognizes it has glucose. It will not last very long because concomitantly, it will go to the pancreas and put out insulin and take the sugar out of the blood. And so that is the kind of the mechanism that we have. And what we want to do is we're going to look at, this is a graph, a kind of a rough graph of the different ways that our blood sugar will vary. So we start off with the fasting blood sugar and we have breakfast and about 20 minutes later it gets up to this kind of minimum line where the brain is happy. It will continue to go up until it gets to this point where the body puts out insulin and because the insulin will take the sugar out of the blood, um, it basically makes the blood sugar go down. That's not a problem because here we're going to have lunch and we redose ourselves and it goes up and it comes down and then here we have dinner, it goes up, it comes down and we stay within that zone. And as we all know, the way that people typically eat and skip meals and so forth, that that's not what happens. So a person doesn't have a really good breakfast and it goes up, but instead of coming down here, it comes down to low here um, around lunchtime. We're still not hungry because it's not below fasting blood sugar levels. We have a light lunch and it goes up and now we're below fasting blood sugar levels. So people are going to get those symptoms, the concentration, the and so forth and so that their body now says have something it didn't say have celery it says have some carbohydrate so the person says well I'll just have uh, there's cookies there's candy I'll have that and the blood sugar goes up but it doesn't stop at this point it keeps going up and now the body is not putting out a regular amount of insulin it's going to dump insulin so instead of coming down gradually, it's going to come down rapidly further than it did before. And now I'm even more craving sugar and they we're all out of control. But every time that the blood sugar enters into here or here, we're basically barring from the liver. We don't want to get in that situation. So for the patient to explain exactly how to eat and prevent this, uh, to keep their liver saturated, we're going to give them three examples. We're going to give them pure glucose candy, we're going to give them orange juice, or we're going to give them an apple. Now each of those is going to be, let's say, 100 calories, and all three of them will turn into glucose and go to the brain. So the same amount of calories, same amount of glucose, and you say, what's the difference? Well, based on calories and passing by the brain, there's no difference, but here's where it becomes significant. So we start with eating the pure glucose, we 
absorb it, it gets into the bloodstream, it goes up, we get a rise in our blood sugar, the pancreas puts out insulin, it goes down. So for that 100 calories of glucose, it's going to keep our blood sugar up about 10 or 15 minutes. Now, what's the difference between the juice and the pure glucose? What does the juice have that the glucose doesn't? And you all know it has fructose. So fructose is sometimes commended, if at all, because it doesn't make the pancreas put out insulin. However, all of these different sugars, when they pass by the brain, will pass by in the form of glucose. So what happens is that fructose goes to the liver and it's converted into glucose. It just is a delay. So basically you'll have that in the juice, the glucose goes up, it comes down, then the fructose changes the glucose, it goes up, it comes down. So it's going to keep that blood sugar up about 30 minutes versus 15 minutes. And finally, we're going to look at the apple. The difference between the apple and the juice is that the apple, in addition, has fiber. And so we think about fiber as a piece of cloth that's tightly woven together, and trapped between those fibers are glucose and fructose. So when it comes down here, it's not necessarily released until you add water, and the water loosens it up, and so you release more glucose and fructose. In other words, with the apple, we have some glucose, it goes up, it comes down, some fructose changes the glucose, it comes up, it comes down, and then the fiber releases more glucose and fructose, it goes up, it comes down, so it's gonna keep our blood sugar up about 60 minutes. So we still need to make it about three to four hours to lunch. So what we're going to add to make that sugar last longer in this zone is we're going to add protein. Once that sugar is used up, it goes through a process called gluconeogenesis. Genesis means the creation, neo, new glucose. So it's going to make new glucose and it's gonna provide a fourth peak that's gonna keep the blood sugar up another uh, total of one to two hours. We still got a ways to go, so now what we're going to do is we're going to add fat. Fat's not going to turn into glucose, but what fat will do is fat controls the emptying of the stomach. So if there's fat in my diet, the pyloric valve opens, lets go of a little bit of food, closes behind it, digests that, opens up, lets it out. So it kind of is a time-releasing factor that is going to make now the blood glucose stay another two to three hours. So we make it from here to there without ever borrowing from our liver. So the take home message for the patient is every time that they eat in order to maintain this where they're not borrowing from the liver is they have to think did I get protein, did I get carbohydrate turn into glucose, fiber and fat. All four need to be included in every time they either have a meal or a feeding. And so, um, now we're gonna play with this, and again, you all know the answers, but patients don't, and we'll say to them, okay, let's say I am in treatment and I just kinda grab a Pop-Tart. How long will that last? Okay. and usually it will last about, at best, around 15 minutes. So we tell the patients that when you have a Pop-Tart, you're taking a vacation from your brain healing. It's just not gonna happen. So then I say, what if you grab a ba plastic bag of Cheerios? How long will that last? And some of the patients will get it from this description. They'll say, well, about an hour because it contains carbohydrate and fiber. It's a complex carbohydrate. And they say, what could you put on that cereal to make it last two hours? And they'll say milk. And I'll say, well, you must mean skim milk because that's what's gonna keep it two hours. So now how can we make that breakfast last three to four hours? And all we have to do is basically add 1% or 2% milk. Very easy system, but important for the patient to see that that's important to always have that type of breakfast where they're kind of combining protein, carbohydrate, fat, and fiber. Now we get to something, and again, this is simplistic for you, but the patient needs to connect with why this is important, especially the anorectic and the starving addict. And what happens is, is now we're going to have, because people who go into treatment sometimes get extremely health-minded. They're going to be on a plant-based diet, and all they're going to have for lunch is a salad, just a huge vegetable salad. And that I'll ask them, well, how much is that going to keep the blood sugar up? And they'll think, well, an hour. And I'll say, well, it actually will not keep it up even 10 seconds. Because in a sense, in a very simplistic sense, the vegetables don't have any calories or carbohydrates, which blows their mind because if you go to the store, and you all know this, and I get a box of broccoli, on that label, the broccoli will be labeled one half cup equals 24 um, calories and six grams of carbohydrate. So it has calories and carbohydrates. And then I'll explain something they never thought of. How do they come up with the calories that are on different products that we purchase? And I'll explain, we use a device 
um, that is called a calorimeter, which again you all know, but I'll explain to them that the calorimeter is a metal container into which we place a half a cup of in this case broccoli. We're surrounding that metal container with a second metal container that contains a measured amount of water. We're going to stick a thermometer in that water. And then we're going to ignite the vegetable and as the vegetable produces heat it'll be transferred to the water and it raises the temperature. Every time it raises the temperature one degree centigrade that's what we call a calorie. And so if we heat that half a cup of broccoli, it will change the temperature, 24 degrees centigrade, we label it 24 calories, we divide four grams, um, um, four calories per gram, and we have six grams of carbohydrate. But that is in the calorimetric, so that's calorimetric, what we put on labels. But physiologically, what's burning in that vegetable, in this case broccoli, is fiber. You do not contain the enzyme that converts um, fiber into glucose. So it goes in one and out the other. So physiologically, it's not really contributing to your overall energy. Okay. So trying to help them very quickly and understandably differentiate between a vegetable and a starch, we would say that vegetables is any plant or plant part that's directly exposed to the sun. If exposed to the sun, it doesn't need uh, energy to grow. It gets all this energy from sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. If it is a starch, it has to store energy to grow. And so that we're going to break up in terms of this particular vegetable and starch, and we'll say vegetable hit by the sun, starch not hit by the sun. Then we'll go to this little game and I'll throw out foods to ask them if it's a vegetable or starch, and I'll say what is lettuce? They'll say vegetable. I will say celery, and some of them don't even know celery, what it is, <laughs> but they'll, the ones who know will say it's a vegetable. I'll say cauliflower, they'll say vegetable, and I say broccoli, and they know that's a vegetable. And I'll say corn, they'll say vegetable, and they always say that, and of course it's not because the corn is covered by a husk. The sun can't hit it, so therefore it has to store energy to grow. The corn is a starch. We'll say peas. Peas are covered by a pod. Sun doesn't hit it. Has to store energy to grow. It's a starch. Carrots are grown in the ground, not exposed to the sun. They basically are a starch. So then we go back to this previous diagram and we say, okay, what can we add to that salad to make it last three or four hours? And so what they'll say is, okay, we could add protein. And I say, well, give me an example. And they'll say cheese or egg or meat. And then some will say, oh, you need fat. And they'll say dressing. But the thing they always forget and that kind of quizzing is they still need the carbohydrate. <laughs> Okay? And then they'll think, because of the previous talk about starches, they'll think about some starch they can add to it or croutons or whatever. Very simple, I know, but important in terms of getting that kind of blood sugar to stay in that particular zone. So um, now we get to, if we had this poor lunch and now we're out here and this blood sugar goes below that fasting blood sugar level, we've got real problems because the body's going to scream and now it needs sugar and we're going to be overwhelmed. Um, but let's say we had a person who their blood sugar didn't go down here, but it went down to here. So in other words, it's a person who's a diabetic and they didn't eat carbohydrates and so now they're in a coma. So I'll ask the patient, okay, so we've got a person in a coma and we've got to get sugar to their brain and we've got really four minutes before there'll be negative changes to that brain. So we're going to kind of figure out what we can give that person during this period in a coma to get their brain working again. And you'll know the answer to this, but I'll say to them, okay, give me some help here. What can we give them? And let's say you're not a doctor, not a nurse, not an EMT, you have to use food. So usually the first thing they'll shout out is either orange juice or sugar. And then I'll apologize because I say, no, I want them to live. Because if you give a person in a coma, orange juice or sugar, they'll choke. They have to basically swallow it to break it down into glucose. And so they're very confused in terms of what can you give when they start talking about glucotabs tabs and, and so forth. Well, all you really need to do for this particular person in that state is put two drops of honey underneath their tongue. And they wonder why the honey. Well, the reason for the honey is that the honey will basically be absorbed by the tongue and go directly to the brain and basically get them out of that state. So they're all taking notes for the first time. Note to self, if I run into a person who's in a coma, make sure I have a honey bear and I'll squeeze it into their mouth. But the point of it is how little it takes. So we have to have that glucose. Um, and then we move to dinner. Usually dinner's not a problem. 
But if we're going to bed, we have dinner at 5 or 6, and we're going to bed at 11 or 12, we probably have to plan to have a snack somewhere around maybe 8.30 or 9. So very simple. So we just get to the point of the two basic messages is every time I eat, I want protein, carbohydrate, fat, and um, fiber, and then I need to eat about every four hours. And so that will basically produce um, the um, needed, desired result. So we have dinner at six, it lasts us to 10. Then we have the snack, that lasts us to two. And now our liver glycogen is saturated, so that will get us through to seven o'clock and our brain will heal. So very simple, but again, we can tell patients that they need to eat this way, but after kind of explaining them this whole process, they kind of get on board and uh, adhere to, and it's very necessary to accelerate this neuroregeneration and neuroplasticity. Oops, something is not. Good. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm just adding this for you. I mean, I know, again, you all are familiar with the problems, and we have lots of problems in treatment centers in terms of healthy eating because of this culprit, glu glu um, gluten. And it's most people, they, it probably doesn't maybe make that much difference, but our patients whose brains are healing, it's extremely important. So that they are all about this wheat belly diet and this gluten, all the celebrities are on it, everybody's bragging about how much help it is to be on these gluten-free diets. And we're trying to kind of, if they don't have celiac disease or been diagnosed with a problem, we want them to basically contribute to their food plan with these grains and so forth. So that we basically help them to see the seriousness of basically going on a gluten-free diet when you don't need to be on a gluten-free diet. Um, and it, as you can see, just in the course of time from 2000 to 2014, the number of people who basically self-diagnose and go on gluten-free diets. And this is really not really good for our patients in terms of the healing brain process. So first of all, and again, many of you probably know this, but they have to replace that gluten with something. So what they replace it with is um, basically rice flour. And rice flour from this country, um, when we analyze it, because the pollution gets in the air, and then these heavy metals called arsenic and mercury, they kind of get down to the ground because the way the roots are very deep and rice plants are, are grown in bogs, they basically absorb that. And that we look at their hair analysis, they have extra arsenic and, and uh, mercury. And so as you see, these studies say that it makes one more prone to diabetes and heart disease. So that's one of the problems. Another problem is, is that we have um, kind of uh, minimized or reduced the amount of neurotube defects in uh, young ladies who are pregnant because we fortify these grains with folic acid. And now that they're basically going on these gluten-free diets, they're um, seeing a much more higher incidence of neurotube defects because they're not replacing it with the folic acid and B vitamins are reduced as well as there's a fiber deficiency on these particular diets. We also know that the bacteria, the microbiome that is in our intestinal tract is extremely important. We'll talk about this a little bit later. It has a whole lot to do with the brain improvement. And there's something called the gut-brain axis. So I know most of you have heard about these chemicals in the brain called serotonin, dopamine, and so forth. And you may not know that where does 95% of the serotonin in your brain come from? The gut, right? So the actual bacteria, the microbiome, transforms these um, substances like tryptophan into serotonin and takes it up to the gut-brain axis. So when you get this alteration of the microflora, you're really interrupting your brain function. And what do healthy bacteria consume? They consume two major diets. One is fiber, the other one is resistant starches. So when people go on these diets, they become deficient in those substances, the microflora changes, and now they have real gut problems because the healthy bacteria are basically diminished and the pathological bacteria increase. So what will happen to our patients is they'll go and they'll be able to stick to these diets maybe two or three months. And then after that two or three months, if they just have one bite of bread, they'll get awfully sick. 
That's because these pathological bacteria love fiber to make lots of gas and foggy brain. So uh, they've actually created their own problem by staying off of it for a period of time. We also know that it's almost probably for people who are not very careful like a celiac disease to stay off of any gluten. So studies were done in terms of restaurants where they get cross-contamination. You basically put pasta in a pot and then the next time you clean it and you put gluten-free pasta, but there's still going to be cross-contamination from the previous load that you've cooked. And so there's food additives that contain um, uh, gluten. So it's really hard not to. So it's almost like it's a little game that they're playing uh, and they're not really serious, but they stay off of the foods that could be healthy for them. Um, and then when we look at the Center for Celiac Research, we look at the uh, North American Society for the Study of Celiac Disease, both of these organizations do not accept that gluca, um, gluten sensitivity exists. Um, and then finally, for our patient, it veils an eating disorder. In other words, they come in, they're trying not to eat food, and it becomes a perfect excuse, okay, here's one whole food group I don't have to eat because I'm gluten sensitive. So what are the two most important actions to ensure there's enough energy for your brain to heal? Very simple, four to five feedings per day, and make sure at every feeding you have complex carbohydrate, which means it contains fiber, plus protein, plus fat. It's very simple, I know, but it kind of is a long discussion that gets our patients to kind of think about eating sensibly and that will help them to accelerate the healing of their brain. Okay, so what's the second most important nutrient? And the young lady back there who said omega-3s was right. So this is the second. And that is, the second most is the fat. And we talk about omega-3s because we take out the water. Um, your brain is about 65% fat. Most of the fats are omega-3s. And most of the omega-3s are DHA or docosahex milk acid. And it's really important, especially when we're talking about youth and adolescents, this fact, because um, the brain has so much fat is because of the membranes. The membranes that make up the cells our neurons have a very thin kind of neuron, but the actual membrane is full of fat. So that's why there's so much fat. And we'll talk about why that fat's so important for the brain. You also have these brain um, axons that are surrounded by a myelin sheath that accelerates the speed at which information is carried. And we also know that the brain doesn't fully mature until a person is 25 years old. So that the what we call the executive functioning part of the brain, the planning, the decision making, all of that doesn't mature until a person is 25. So it's very explainable why adolescents make poor decisions because their brain isn't totally on track. And the only people who accept this and practice it are um, rental cars. You can't rent a car until you're 25 because they don't think that a person whose brain is not developed should be driving uh, their cars. But nonetheless, it takes about the 25 to this whole kind of fat um, uh, takes place and it also basically regulates the inflammation which we'll talk about in the brain later. So 60% of the brain by dry weight is fat. Now we're going back in time to uh, paleo times about 12,000 years ago and the two species that were dominant at the time uh, in history were the Neanderthals that were in the northern part of Europe and Russia and then the um, Africanus who was in the Rift Valley of East Africa. And the um, Africanus, they were going extinct because of incredible droughts, um, lack of uh, water. And so as the streams dried up um, and there was no food, what the um, Africanus consumed was basically um, what you would call pond scum. And as they ate the pond scum, the brains eventually went from the size here that you see, that is, um, 380 cc's brain, very small, and it kind of increased to the current size of our brains, are about 1,500 cc's. Now, if you're in an area that's a drought, you would say, well, wouldn't you kind of get up and go find food? Well, the brains weren't that big, so they just kind of sat and starved until they basically began to say, we need to migrate. So they migrated from the Rift Valley up to the Crescent Valley with a larger brain and hunting and gathering did not in any shape or form provide enough energy for the person's brain to work. It had a bigger brain. So that became the, the era of agriculture. So we began to grow plants and breads and wheats and grains that basically supported this much bigger brain.
Um, so uh, that Neanderthal's average life expectancy was about 19 years. Uh, this is the size of the human brain. And if you make it to 50, your average life expectancy is going to be 93. So uh, you can either be on paleo or you can be on a healthy, balanced diet and your brain survives. Now, this DHA is so important, which you know, that when we have babies, because we want that rapid growth of the brain to be in the womb, but even importantly, the first year or two of life, and certainly the first six months. So if I feed my baby with DHA fortified, the, the, the formulas are fortified, so make sure that the baby gets enough DHA for that brain to form. What becomes difficult and is important to explain to the malnourished anorectic is if they were pregnant and they chose to nurse, where does their DHA come from if they don't consume the foods like fish and nuts that contain DHA? So let's say you have a woman whose baby is um, you know, a month old, two months, and she's nursing it. Where does the DHA come from for the baby? Does anyone know? Go ahead. Brain. Brain? It comes from the mom's brain to the baby. That's a great guess. I mean, I would, I would say the same thing. That makes a lot of sense. But the reason we tell the patients this, and this is the truth, that the whole time prior to pregnancy that they've been existing, their body is storing every possible gram of DHA it can. And it's storing it in the hips and thighs. So a female's hips and thighs stores their DHA. So now you can see why when a person's malnourished and thin, they really couldn't support their baby by nursing them. They need to have fat in their hips and thighs. So here is the important thing that we're trying to communicate, the importance of DHA to the brain. And as I showed you before, you have nerves that are communicating with other nerves, and so these vesicles contain the neurotransmitter. They shoot them across this space called a synapse, and it's going to attach to a receptor. And when it attaches to the receptor, you get a response. So, that think of these receptors like a catcher. Okay, and these are baseballs being thrown to this catcher. And let's say we put a catcher over in this corner of the room. I'm gonna take a basket of baseballs over there, pick someone in the audience, and I'm gonna have them throw the balls to this catcher, and for every ball that catcher catches, I'm gonna give everyone in the audience $100. So they're all excited, and when the person starts throwing the balls, they throw the ball over here, 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 and they never hit the glove, you don't get any money. And you're all disappointed, and they say, well, can we get a second chance, and can we make one change? What change would you make so that the catcher catches more balls? Okay, well you might say have bigger baseballs, you might say have a bigger glove, all those things can't happen in terms of what we do to the brain. But you say, what if the catcher actually moved to catch the ball? That makes sense? <laughs> Goes and moves. Well that's exactly what happens in the brain with DHA. Because you have in that fatty membrane, you have fats and you have the receptors. When you have an omega-3, the omega-3 is very flexible. It has double bonds. So what it means is that those receptors can move in the membrane and catch those neurotransmitters. So the more that we have flexibility or fluidity in the membrane, the better our brain functions. So again, what we typically do a lot of times to make this happen is if we basically want to have more, the catcher catch more, we keep giving them more baseball. So that's what basically a lot of the medications like um, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, anxiolytic drugs, uh, atypical um, um, drugs, they basically are creating more baseballs. But what also would help is to make these membranes more flexible by basically making sure we have enough uh, omega-3s. So it makes the membranes flexible, so you hear what a saturated fat, it has no double bonds, it's very tight, very stiff, so you can't really get much response and catching more baseballs, but when we take the unsaturated fat that has lots of double bonds, it's fluid, and basically the receptors can move within the membrane. So it's clear that it is important for people to get enough omega-3s, and also when they're replacing cells, they're also replacing the membranes and replace them with a diet that contains omega-3s. Okay, another thing that's kind of confusing to patients, they hear about it, but they have no clue about what is so bad if I have too many um, trans fatty acids. 
So a very complicated science, but we'll tell them, okay, a typical natural fatty acid is a cis configuration, so it forms like a boat at the double bond. It kind of constricts on itself. And when we basically do certain uh, processing of that fat, um, like deep frying, or like say, adding hydrogens or hydrogenation, we basically open up that and it becomes larger. And what this difference configuration is when we place it in the membranes of the um, nerves in the brain, that this is where we have the fats and the neurotransmitter goes easily through, but when you have trans fatty acids, it changes the configuration of the receptor, and it's not as responsive. So the idea is to basically cut down on our intake, but not eliminate necessarily, but cut down on our intake of processed foods or saturated um, trans fatty acids. Okay. So um, this is just something interesting that we're trying to convince the patients that what the answer is and the first thing they'll think of is what? I'm going to go and get fatty acids, I'm going to go get um, omega-3 fatty acids, and I'll explain to them that back in the 70s, they really thought that these um, omega-3s were going to help people who had heart problems, and heart disease is a big issue still, but it was a major issue around the 70s. And so there's a lot of advertisements about the fact that you have certain populations around the world and they don't have heart attacks because they eat a lot of fish. So, and the fish contains fish oils that helps um, produce these omega-3s. So people started buying up lots, it became a multi-million dollar industry in the 70s, and who was checking to make sure that those products you purchased contained omega-3s? And you all know, no one, right? Because these supplements are not controlled by the FDA. They're controlled by the health food industry. And so the only people at the time that we really care or put out information and do the research was a place called Consumer Reports. So Consumer Labs, because now omega-3s are on the radar and people are buying lots of them, they took and went and got the top selling brands, 22 of the top selling brands, and they analyzed them to see what their content of omega-3s was. And no surprise to you, but it was extremely low, almost non-existent. He said, how could that happen? Because even back in the 70s, most of our fish comes from fish farms. And what they fed the fish back then was cornmeal. And you can't make omega-3s from cornmeal. And so, um, therefore, none of the products had it. So they really weren't cheating people, they just didn't know. And uh, today we don't have to worry because the way that they're made today is we basically take that pond scum is basically the precursor for omega-3s, linolenic acid, and algae and plankton is where it comes from. So little fish that are in the ocean are caught that feed on that and have loads of omega-3. And then on the fish farms, we feed the fish fish meal. So they get plenty of omega-3s. But again, the thing is, is that um, there's better ways nutritionally to get this than necessarily the supplements. Um, so this is just kind of an interesting digression, but uh, I've always been fascinated by this term snake oil because I'm kind of uh, so research oriented that you know, lots of these products that are out there um, are not what they tend to be. So people say, well, it's just snake oil. Well, the history of snake oil in these two books um, uh, point this out, goes back to um, the post-Civil War era where they're building the Transcontinental Railroad. And they're gonna build it from the west to the east and the east to the west. And who the workers were on this railroad from the east to the west were brawny, strong Irishmen. And um, who built the railroad from the west to the east were um, Asians, particularly Chinese, were more diminutive, extremely hard workers. They had the hardest job. And as they were being observed as a community, it turns out that the average life expectancy of the Irish that built the railroad was about 43. The average life expectancy for the Chinese that built the railroad was almost 20 years greater. People were concerned about living long then, just as they are now, and they noticed that the um, Chinese that built the railroad, they would go off by themselves, and they would cook their meals in a wok, and they would add an oil. Um, and that oil they added was from snakes, but it was made from sea snakes that contained omega-3s. And so what the snake oil is, is that these um, medicine men would go off out to the uh, areas where they found gold and they would sell elixirs that they called the famous um, snake oil that the um, Asians were eating that helped them to have a long life. 
and yet it contained no omega-3s. So it's basically when you say a product is something that it's not, um, that's where that term comes from. So what are the two second most important considerations for brain healing? And those are two grams and why it's not accurate is because people aren't putting research into exactly how much so that the conclusion is from the few studies that are done that a person needs two grams of omega-3 fatty acids per day which is kind of nice because you can get that as an average if you just have two servings per week of cold water fatty fish so typically people eat salmon and tuna and that's a good source or they can take products that contain alpha-linolenic acids and your body can convert them to omega-3s so that would be things like nuts or flaxseed okay so that if a person doesn't like fish or they don't like nuts um, that certainly is permissible to get a certainly respectable brand of omega-3s and take two grams per day um, the interesting thing about omega-3s is people will complain if they do take the capsules that they get fish breath and I think you probably know what the secret is is to prevent fish breath anybody know what you do to the capsules they don't get that odor you take and you put them in the freezer and they're frozen and they basically don't thaw until they pass the pyloric valve and they can't come back to haunt you so you just freeze those capsules um, in terms of the other fats again I never say all food is good food for sure and to at least convince the patient to minimize their intake of trans fats saturated fats and omega-6s omega-6s were considered to be good but now everything we have has omega-6s so if you go to a fast food restaurant and you get a hamburger and a Coke and french fries, probably 85% of what you ate comes from corn, which basically is omega-6s. So the bun has um, uh, omega-6 fats. Uh, they cook the french fries before they send them to the McDonald's in fat. They parboil them in omega-6s and then they cook them again in omega-6. And then of course the um, soda is high fructose corn syrup. And then we also know that the fructose comes from corn and we also know that the beef are fed corn so we get entirely too much omega-6 so it's not about eliminating it but minimizing it for maximum brain healing and function okay so now we're going to go to the third item in terms of the brain and that is to ask the question was there a time when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere and you didn't live back then but four and a half billion years ago there's no oxygen in the atmosphere how do we get oxygen? Um, basically, it's called photosynthesis. That's what puts oxygen back in the atmosphere. And that, um, what was the, end, the original plant that was on the Earth once we had oxygen? So the original plant that was um, species that was on the Earth back um, when we started to have oxygen is this plant that's called cyanobacter. It's a transparent, it has a clear thing. And what happened is, is that as the plant put oxygen in the atmosphere, the oxygen mixed with the only other elements that were in the atmosphere, which was carbon, methane, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and it formed free radicals. And those free radicals came back down and destroyed the very plant that created them. So it took a long time, it took about two and a half billion years till nature figured out how to survive in this atmosphere and the, what we call reactive oxygen species. And so what that plant that actually took hold was called the blue-green algae. And what's important about that is that word blue-green, not necessarily blue and green, but pigments. Pigments are the source of what protects these plants from these reactive oxygen species or free radicals, and that is called antioxidants. So the way that simplistically an antioxidants work, we have a uh, oxygen or any type of molecule that has electron chains and they have to be paired off. Once it loses an electron, then it becomes very reactive. And so you take and have antioxidants that will take and do the following. They'll scavenge and look for these free radicals, then they'll sacrifice their own uh, electrons and they'll neutralize that free radical and then those antioxidants need to be continuously replenished 
So this primarily, when we talk about the source, is going to be plants, but not just um, our old cliche when we were growing up, you need to eat your fruits and vegetables. You need to eat a variety of highly pigmented fruits and vegetables. And that highly pigmented is because of this mechanism of the antioxidants. So what does that have to do with the brain? Well, here's three things that's critical that a person whose brain is healing wants to protect those new cells and then wants to protect them from reactive oxygen species. And why is there more oxygen in the brain when it's healing? Because that it uses glucose and when glucose is basically metabolized, it is considered to be a metabolic process that contains oxygen. You need a lot of oxygen to burn sugar. Um, it's aerobic. Aerobic means using oxygen. So you have a lot of oxygen coming from metabolizing all of that glucose to help heal the brain. And then the brain is made mostly of these fatty acids called omega-3s. Those omega-3s have lots of double bonds. When it's exposed to lots of oxygen, that oxygen is going to basically uh, combine with those double bonds and it's going to make that fat rancid and useless. So we want to prevent the rancidity of these new fats that are basically in the brain um, and we need antioxidants. And finally, if you know if you have an iron rake and you kept it outside, it's damp, and you come and get it, it's going to be rusty. Rust is oxidation. So we have lots of blood going to the brain, a lot of oxidation of that iron, and so basically we have lots of oxidation going on and we have to keep it in control. And how we keep it in control is through antioxidants. Antioxidants that you get in supplements is not significant because there's so many different antioxidants to different things and not just oxidants but nitrogen and so forth. So that plants and the different pigments, you want to get a variety of different pigments, will help to neutralize these particular um, um, processes. So that um, another thing that plants do, which again you all know, but um, Plants contain things that are called phytonutrients. These are naturally occurring substances that protect the plant and imparts color, odor, and flavor. So the plant has to protect itself too from insects and birds, through, from viruses, bacteria, yeast, and um, things of that nature. It has to protect itself from radiation, pollution, protect itself from overcrowding, it has to protect itself from, from droughts and um, uh, heavy rains. So the plant has to protect itself, and how it does that is through its content of phytonutrients. And what we have to do as humans, when we consume the plant, it in, allows us to basically get those same protections and things like anti-inflammatory, so forth and so on. But the key thing is, is the, the variety of those different species. So, again, I'm not promoting any diets, but as we look at the history of diets and health, we find that for the last um, 40 years, every time they do an evaluation of the healthiest type of food plants for people, that the Mediterranean diet comes up. And what we'll talk about, because we're talking about the brain, is it turns out that these um, anti-inflammatory potential of these phytonutrients help to basically reduce symptoms of depression. And it also basically influences the microbiome. So if we just do a simple um, analysis between the typical Western diet and the healthier inclusion of foods in the Mediterranean diet, we can see that this kind of adds all the things that we've been talking about so far, but the particular thing is going to be as a phytonutrient. The two things that really are insignificant in terms of of this Mediterranean diet is lots of olive oil and lots of red wine. Not saying negative about red wine or olive oil, but we don't need all of that extra olive oil, nor is red wine necessary. And that's important for our patients or addicts because they just love this. They say, oh, we have red wine. No. Um, so here we go into this um, extension to understand how the brain works with trauma and the importance of um, feeding the brain in order where we're helping patients to kind of overcome trauma. So just a brief kind of description of what trauma looks like in the brain, that you're taking information and you're consolidating it in the long-term memory. And this usually happens during a phase of sleep that's called REM sleep. When you have a traumatic event, or you have a series of repetitive traumatic events that's called little t and big t, then these consolidation of memories are basically encapsulated. So it looks like this. You 
have this memory that is locked and you can't get at it when you want to get at it but it will get to you on its own and you can have just a thought or a cue that opens up that capsule and basically uh, gets into the present motion we call that uh, it's intrusive sometimes it basically stays locked so people tend to dissociate when they get cues or thoughts and that's the behavior and so people are taking around this condition in their brain all the time and they can't get rid of that trauma uh, so this dissociation capsule um, causes uh, a certain change that there is something in our brain that is going to be what we call a dimmer switch and the dimmer switch is called the prefrontal cortex which is in the front of our brain and this dimmer switch is going to control an area called the amygdala think of the amygdala like a um, uh, smoke alarm it's kind of this arousal center so every time you get that thought or cue it's going to activate that amygdala and it's going to be overwhelming and now we're deep in our state of trauma and usually it is basically controlled by this dimmer switch which is called the P prefrontal cortex in individuals who have trauma who continue to have it chronically that they basically cannot get the dimmer switch to work because it's gone offline it fails to inhibit what we call amygdala kindling. So once you have trauma, it's sort of like it kind of goes down, but your amygdala is like kindling or it's um, basically it's a slow flame. So think of it like a fire. This is like I don't have the trauma right now. And then I get activated and it gets to a full fire. And what the PFC is going to do, it's going to basically dimmer that fire. But with offline, it can't do that. So it's very overwhelming. What they have recently found is that disconnection going offline is shows up in the brain as gliosis another word for inflammation so there's inflammation between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala and so that what they found at the University of Colorado and they were doing research now especially for military and trying to predict who is going to get post-traumatic stress disorder they found out that a bacterium that's in the soil it's called the dirty, va uh, dirty virus mycobacterium vaxi that stimulates the immune system and counteracts the inflammation so they'll begin to identify basically soldiers who are prone towards this and actually give them this vaccine that will help prevent PTSD. But in the meantime, we do know that eating foods that are basically high in inflammatory substances like fruits and vegetables are an excellent way to help the person who is recovering from these trauma conditions. Okay, so what two groups of foods are critical to brain healing? And we said a variety of darkly pigmented fruits and vegetables, not just fruits and vegetables. And we find at a minimum, an individual con should consume five servings of vegetables per day and a minimum of three servings of fruits per day. And I know that you probably tracked the Haynes studies, and I think it was back in the uh, early 2000s that only 17% of the population consumed two fruits a day. So who knows who's actually consuming three. So very important for our patients to get this intake of these fruits and vegetables per day for the purposes of anti-inflammation as well as antioxidants. So now we talk about when I ask patients what do you think is the most important uh, nutrient they always yell out protein. I'm not saying that protein is not important but it's really um, you just need a minimum of protein. I think in terms of the body as well as the brain, we don't need loads and loads of protein. So I'll tell the patients that, that the reason you need the protein is all of these communicating chemicals called neurotransmitters, they're all from monoamines. They're all made from monoamines. Monoamine is a single amino acid. So just like letters make up words, amino acids make up proteins. So every single one of these neurotransmitters basically is preceded and made up of a amino acid. So tryptophan and you make serotonin. Uh, melanin and tyrosine make dopamine, norepinephrine, glutamine and glutamine make GABA. So they're all very important. I'm not minimizing it, but we don't need as much protein as a lot of people think, especially um, when we get in the male population and eating disorders. So that trying to explain to them how little you need is, I'll explain, you do not store protein. You store fat, you store carbohydrates, but you can't store protein. Um, and that how can they prove to me 
exactly how much protein they lose per day because all they have to do is replace what they lose every day and so some of them will guess that they could basically collect their urine so I explain yes because nitrogen is only in proteins so as the protein breaks down the nitrogen becomes free it can be toxic to the brain if it combines with hydrogen so the body has a mechanism called urea that it packages it and gets rid of the debris called nitrogen and if we measure the nitrogen in urine we can extrapolate backwards and we can see how much protein a person has to replace every day and so for the average person that females need I mean males need about nine ounces or 63 grams per day and then the females need about 42 grams or six ounces so again very important but um, most of the time um, we certainly would get enough and we could certainly have more if that's um, amenable so water is obvious I'm not saying that it's not important um, but usually we need to replace 12 cups per day and most people don't do that which is okay because most of our fluids come from the foods that we eat most of the fluids come from food when you cut back on food like a lot of these patients that we see who are uh, healing their brain um, they get um, very low and even a 2% drop in the body's normal water content causes a drop in performance and so forth so water is important and we make sure that people are hydrated we don't over exercise it if they're eating food okay so we've already mentioned the gut microbiota um, and we're finding especially in brain health this is becoming more and more important and um, that when we have realized that there is a connection between the microbiome which is the bacteria and the brain um, that it becomes extremely significant so uh, if a person has stress which all of our patients do in all these categories uh, anxiety or depression that stress and inadequate nutritional intake that's feeding these micro bacteria properly then they get a condition called dysbiosis so that means the balance of healthy and unhealthy bacteria typically in a healthy person they might have 20 percent pathological bacteria and 80 percent um, healthy bacteria but as individuals have more stress and inadequate nutrition they begin to get this balance gets um, towards more unhealthy bacteria once that environment of unhealthy bacteria it kind of changes the protective membranes that line the intestinal tract and again it's not like this picture shows but basically it's easier for things that basically can enter into the body because of these leaky guts and when it does get into the body then it's going to change the messages to the brain and cause all sorts of kind of disarray or imbalance so it's very important that we basically correct this because this inflammation and comprised immunity is going to affect the healing of the brain and cause more detriment to the brain so that it alters this gut brain axis and as a result we see a much greater increase in anxiety and depression so that the amazing thing which I'm sure many of you have heard of we talk back again about this treatment resistant depression Parkinson's um, even autism spectrum disorder um, uh, eating disorders and so forth we're finding and we even talk about weight we're finding that at least in animal studies and a few human studies that we can correct this almost immediately by something called fecal transplants if we take the fecal contents of someone who's healthy or at a, um, a healthier weight or whatever um, or not depressed and we transplant their bacteria into a person who's struggling with those conditions we get amazing results now we're probably a long way from doing these uh, for these conditions and the only thing that's approved today for is C. diff and one thing and again I am respecting this coronavirus okay but I think fortunately in the US no one has died yet from it okay anybody want to know how many cases so far during the flu season that we've had of influenza which is the flu okay. probably well over 8,500 cases but I'm sorry no well over um, four to five million cases in the US okay, of influenza and how many people have died it's over 8,500 <laughs> Okay. If you talk about what is the only thing approved for fecal transplants, it's for a uh, bacterium called C. diff. 
Okay? You may not know, but there's over 500,000 cases of C. diff a year in the U.S. And there has been over 3,500 uh, to um, um, 8,000 deaths per year of C. diff. And we're not hearing about that, which is certainly a consideration um, in our health. So yes, fecal transplants can be used for C. diff. Now, here is, people always say, okay, if our bacteria are imbalanced, what would be the perfect thing to do? Why don't we feed a person these probiotics? And right now, I can't get on board with that based on the research, and you will see this listed here, and particularly these two individuals that come from the um, uh, universe, uh, from Ireland, that are the experts in terms of the microbiome. And this is their conclusion. If you hear their talks, this is what they talk about in terms of the reality of probiotics. It lacks well-designed studies. These studies are inconsistent and have methodological limitations, it's marred by confounding factors, results with anorectic lack replication, they are small scale studies, and here's the key thing that Dr. Cryer talks about if you hear him talk, is the quantity that you get in those products is too low. Now if you see, it says 50 million, that sounds like a lot. Anybody know how many bacterium uh, colonized live in your intestinal tract? Anybody know the number? It's over a hundred trillion. <laughs> so 50 billion is insignificant. Okay? How many species are there in these products that we purchase? At best, the most I've seen is like 13. Okay? 13 species. There's anywhere from 8,000 to 33,000 species in your intestinal tract. So this is Dr. Uh, Cryer's conclusion. To take a probiotic would be like going from Birmingham, Alabama to the West Coast and you're gonna stand on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. You're going to spit into the Pacific Ocean. You're gonna travel all the way back to Birmingham and get up to the podium and say, I've just made the Pacific Ocean wetter. <laughs> That's how insignificant it is based on the studies. Uh, the dosage has not been studied in humans. Research still is in its infancy and outpacing the science in terms of recommending it. Most studies are on animal models, I think I already said that. Rarely more than two clinical trials were conducted on the same probiotic and only a handful of the hundreds of probiotics has been proved effective. So again, I think that as we keep researching it, um, we might find better improvements, but the best thing to do is basically to change our stress, to change our diet, and feed the healthy bacteria, and when we have the opportunity, to eat fermented products. So caffeine, now I will talk to you about this so I don't have to hide because I know people love their coffee. 98% of adults drink coffee. It's the fourth, uh, third or fourth leading beverage in this country and Starbucks and so forth has made a fortune off it. So this is basically, we're talking about patients that we're seeing whose brains are healing. You can take a deep breath and not necessarily worry about this, but this is the problem. So caffeine, we're not talking about coffee here, we're talking about caffeine, because it turns out it's like a Trojan horse. There's a lot of good things we find in terms of the coffee bean, and you probably know them like chlorogenic acid and phyto uh, polyphenols and so forth that have been shown helpful. But with caffeine, the thing is, is that if we look just at spec scans, you'll see the normal brain, and you see if we give this patient either caffeine or nicotine, it causes a kind of a disarray of the brain. So we do know it causes these uh, changes that are not healthy in the brain. We also know that it's a psychoactive drug. You know, you can't find people who, um, you can't see anything about food addiction or that in the DSM-5, but you do see that caffeine is considered an addictive substance, it's a psychoactive substance. It also makes these patients that we work with that are addicts, it makes kind of the dopamine keep trickling so they're always on the edge of relapse when they consume coffee in terms of recovery. We also know that caffeine increases cortisol and cortisol is neurotoxic to new developing brain cells. And when you think about it, um, most people that don't have problems with their brain healing um, and they drink coffee, their brain and their body gets adapted to it. So it no longer causes those changes. And it almost doesn't cause the changes as a stimulant. What 
The reason we think why people need their coffee in the morning, if you ever study cortisol, you'll see it goes in a circadian rhythm. In other words, it stays lower at night so you can sleep, and then it gets higher so you can be awake during the day. So in terms of that circadian rhythm, the absolute highest point that your cortisol reaches is 30 minutes after you wake up. So it's part of the waking up. And so that when people don't wake up, what do they do? They think it's a stimulant, but basically it's raising their cortisol. So in our patients, it raises the cortisol, and that can be detrimental to the healing process. Uh, and it also, and new studies are coming out, and you can, I think they were just in the paper last week of these studies, but even for some people, having a cup of coffee in the morning can affect their sleep at night. And what it does, it actually, as we become more active during the day, we basically produce ATP, which has adenosine, and the adenosine attaches to the receptors in the brain that basically make you able to sleep. Caffeine blocks adenosine, so you're really not more awake, it's just that it's masking the fact that you're tired. And um, so it causes sleep disturbance. Now who it causes sleep disturbances is, and we're, we're doing more of this in our treatment centers, is that some people are fast metabolizers and some people are slow metabolizers. So if you are genetically a fast metabolizer, it really doesn't matter even for our patients. But if you're a slow metabolizer, it's definitely something you don't want to have caffeine if your brain is healing. So we do this um, to get the point across to the patients. And this is a kind of a silly study. You should see it goes back to 1982. And what they did in this study is they took um, containers and into those containers, they're going to put flies, common house flies. And each container contains a different substance. So one contains nothing, one contains LSD, one contains mescaline, one contains hashish, and one contains caffeine. And they're going to basically keep those flies in there for a period of time, and then they're going to remove the flies, and they're going to feed those flies to spiders. And then the spiders are going to weave their webs, and we're going to look at the different webs that are woven from the different flies that were basically in certain environments. So in the fly that said no to drugs, you see it's nicely formed, okay? Very geometrical, um, perfectly formed, okay? Then we look at the spider that basically was fed on flies from LSD, not so good. The ones that were fed on mescaline, even worse. The ones that were fed on hedge weeds, even worse. And look at the ones that were fed caffeine. <laughs> That's your brain healing on caffeine. So they kind of get the message. All right. Now, I, I don't know what your philosophies are about vitamins and minerals. Uh, I will share my experience with vitamins and minerals. Um, in the course of my nutrition education, um, I think there was a mantra that I heard ad infinitum and ad nauseum. And that was you do not need vitamins and minerals if you eat a healthy, balanced diet. Over and over again I heard that. And when I was in my residency um, and working in the hospital, um, there were pink ladies. There were volunteers, and there were men, and they were called gray men. And I'm working in this environment. Uh, there was a particular individual. He was always laughing, always singing, always in the company of a young woman. And I was mentioning someone, and I said, he's just so positive, you know, and he's, he's in his 70s. He says, no, he is 92 years old. And I was just so impressed in terms of um, how well he did for someone that age and volunteering in the hospital. So I actually went up to him and I said, sir, how do you do it? How do you stay so young? And his answer was, pills, my boy, pills. I said, do you um, take them? He says, no, I sell them. <laughs> Um, but the, and the idea is, is that they're, they're kind of not important. So then I went to school, as I said, I got my PhD at Auburn, and everybody in the department, when you got to the topic of vitamins, would say, you don't need vitamins and minerals, you need a healthy, balanced diet. And um, so I was trying to make some money at the time and babysitting for my major professor, who was the worst at saying you don't need vitamins and minerals. So I'm there, it's about 11, 30, 12 o'clock, I'm getting hungry, so I'm scourging through the um, cabinets, and lo and behold, I find a half-used bottle of vitamins in his cabinet. So he comes home, I wait till he pays me, and then I bring out the vitamins. And I said, what are these? He said, those are vitamins. I said, who takes them? He says, I do. I said, well, I thought you said we don't need vitamins and minerals if we eat a healthy, balanced diet. Why do you take them? He says, in case I'm wrong. <laughs> so I think that there is something to say about that in the way that people kind of eat and so forth. And we see so many vitamins that um, we really, in my career of 40 years, it keeps changing.
So one of the things that is interesting in terms of things that change is back in the um, old days, uh, we used to be in the doctor's lounge and the doctor would come in and laugh about the patient came in that was a senior citizen and after they kind of gave their initial um, complaint, then they wanted to stay there all day and talk about other complaints. They talk about burning tongue and their hair itched and things that really aren't treatable. And they found out in the 70s and 80s that you could just get your nurse in, whisper in her ear, and she would come back with a vial full of pretty pink fluid called B12. And they would get B12 shots and we'd look about what a great placebo it was. And then as we learned more about vitamins, we found out, yeah, if you're below 55, you only need three micrograms. But when you get older and you don't absorb it, it's a very complicated absorption process. Now you need at least 50 micrograms. So we weren't right. And then we found out that, um, um, anybody here a dentist? No one's here as a dentist? Okay, so if you talk to your dentist, you'll say that, you know, we've done a great job of getting people to kind of get off the sugary drinks, especially children, the sugary drinks, but it hasn't helped dental cavities. There's more dental cavities as children are drinking more bottled water. Why is there so many more cavities that children are drinking bottled water? Fluoride. So bottled water doesn't contain fluoride, more cavities. And so it'd be fine if, okay, children, instead of drinking um, Cokes to get fluoride in the water, then why don't you basically eat more fruits and vegetables? They don't compensate for what's lost. Um, then we find that we're seeing a lot more thyroid problems in young women that are childbearing age, between 25 and 35. And why is that? Well, they turn out that they have thyroid problems because of their diet, because they're not getting enough iodine. And why aren't they getting enough iodine? Because they're listening to us and say, cut down your salt. And salt becomes a major source of their iodine through iodized salt. So we go list and list, and certainly vitamin D is becoming a problem. Here I am, a nutritionist, and I go to my doctor, and guess what I'm deficient in? Vitamin D, okay? I used to be out running all the time. Now I have my own treadmill in my house. And I travel. Yeah, I kind of leave the cab to the hotel. But that's about as much sunshine as I get. And uh, so we're finding that maybe it is a good idea. Few people eat correctly, unfortunately, despite um, our guidelines. And maybe it's an insurance. So I don't have a problem with people um, having a vitamin a day just as insurance. Okay, so now... Um, this is kind of, I think, interesting in some respects um, that this squirrel says, when I learned you are what you eat, I realized I was nuts. Okay, so that's crazy. And I'm sure you would not want to be called nuts. That would be kind of an insult. However, I want you to think of the following. Okay, so we're going to look at walnuts. Okay, now you probably know, but most people don't know, that the way the walnut appears on the tree is that it grows and it's covered by a skin covered by a green skin, okay? And if we look at the brain, we find that our heads are covered by a skin. Now we go into the brain, and we look at a walnut, we cut the walnut open, and look what we see, that it's broken into two halves. And the brain basically has two halves. It also basically is convoluted, as you see here, and you see your brain is convoluted. It's also, when we kind of look at the brain, we see that the brain is connected to the skull by membranes, and we see that the nut is connected to the shell, the hard skull, with a membrane. And so it turns out that the walnut is almost exactly the same as the brain. And the neat thing is, is all the things I've shared with you is basically the walnut contains all of those ingredients. <laughs> So not that you eat walnuts, but we're kind of all nuts because that's what our brains look like. Okay, so I'm going to kind of end with this and I'll open up the questions. This little girl here um, is my granddaughter. Her name's Lily. She's nine years old and she stays with us frequently and frequently when I am home, I'm there with her and uh, this is her BFF friend. And you see, they kind of um, look like they're at odds with one another. And I was home one day, and they're arguing. They're just loud as can be, interrupting my concentration. And instead of interrupting them, I'm listening to what they're arguing about. And they're arguing about something very important. They're arguing about whose mother is the oldest. And this is what girls argue about, I guess. So they're arguing about who's the oldest. And finally, Lily's friend says, well, how old is your mom? And Lily says, I don't know. <laughs> she said, Just go and ask your mom how old she is. So Lily goes and asks her mom. And her mom's kind of pissed. Now why is she pissed? Because she says, some things are personal and we just don't share. 
So he doesn't tell Lily how old she is. So Lily goes back to her friend and says, well, how old is your mom? She says, she won't tell me. Well, her friend's not upset. Her friend says, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to go to your mother's purse. And in her purse, there's a wallet. And in the wallet, there's a plastic card. Go look at that plastic card. So Lily goes to her mother's wallet and gets out that card. And she's amazed at the information that's on that card. So amazed, instead of going back to her friend, she goes back to her mom and says, Mom, I know that you're 37 years old, that you're 5 feet 4 inches tall, and you weigh 128. And the reason that Dad left you is you got an F in sex. Now, I'm not sexist, this is a true story from a little girl who's nine years old. But that is her perception. Okay? You all know what that means, but to a nine-year-old, that's what it meant to her. Okay? So that it's important that what we know from years of training is so obvious. But some of the things that seem so obvious are not obvious to the patients who we treat. And sometimes we have to kind of figure out how to kind of get into their heads to follow some very basic and simple and useful techniques that deal with eating. And in my world, it's a little bit more complex because I'm trying to have them eat so their brain heals. But just saying, if you eat properly, your brain will heal, doesn't seem to get it. I gave a talk, I think now, it's quite a while ago, maybe five years ago, at the American Dietetic Association. And it was called, um, food does not become nutrition until it passes the lips. So people will tell you all the time about what to eat and how great they eat, but it's getting them to actually do it. And so in this world that I work in, in terms of neuroscience, that it can be very helpful that people can visualize exactly what happens when you basically kind of get and tip the balance in the wrong direction. So I don't know if you know who this person is. Probably they all look too young, but his name is Wayne Newton. He was the number one performer in Las Vegas. And if you had the opportunity to hear him perform in Las Vegas, he always ended his talks the following way. He said, give me your money, and all you do is give me your money. But give me your time, and you give me a part of your life. I want to thank you for sharing a good part of your morning with me today. Thank you.